Welcome back to the Simple Cyber Defense Podcast. I know it's been a while since I've made a podcast episode or a video. The reason for this is due to some personal hardships in my life. I've been going through a divorce. Three, two, one. Welcome back to the Simple Cyber Defense Podcast. I know it's been a while since I made a podcast episode or a video. The reason for this is due to some personal hardships in my life. Going through a divorce and then recently losing my job, I've not had much motivation to do anything. Unfortunately, I do not make any money on the podcast or the YouTube channel, and this has taken a large toll on my mental health. I've even contemplated giving up. I have not seen much growth nor any income. This made me feel like I was failing. And then I realized that this was depression talking. And this gave me an idea to turn this hardship into a podcast episode. Luckily, I've had a friend named Sarah Dickerson, who is very knowledgeable in the field of mental health. So I reached out to her and we sat down to discuss the link between cybersecurity and mental health. And this is what we talked about. Welcome back to Simple Cyber Defense. In this week's episode, we are going to be discussing mental health and how it affects the ability to be prone to social engineering attacks. I'm here with uh, Sarah Dickinson. If, if you want to just uh, start off by telling us a little bit about your background and, and what experiences you have with the uh, mental health. Mm. Okay, so I have a uh, well-being and health and wellness certificate from Rice University, and I've been studying uh, mental wellness and um, mental health for five, six years, I think, uh, at this point, and I've learned a lot about keeping ourselves safe and keeping ourselves healthy, and um, so I'm excited to talk about how that it can extend to cybersecurity today. Yeah. So the main reason for this podcast is a kind of scary statistic where 95% uh, of most of the uh, data breaches has started off with some kind of social engineering. So we're going to start off with um, how would you or what would you say is the biggest link between mental health and cybersecurity is yeah so social engineering is <clears throat> just a form a uh, fancy word for emotional manipulation uh, and hackers or con artists will use your emotions and your inability to deal with emotions to trick you into giving them information uh, so that they can steal resources from maybe your place of work or your computer uh, your your home data so it, it is really deeply integrated, uh, social engineering is, with psychology in the sense that they use these psychological tricks uh, to get past your emotional defenses because 97% of people, if, if they can reach the person, they can get the data. Uh, so that's really where psychology comes into play in that. So would you say that everyone is kind of susceptible to these type of tactics or is it just a specific group of people oh absolutely everyone <clears throat> anyone that has has data data is uh the new currency these days and um so anything that hackers or conners can do to kind of throw you off uh, have you stressed out get you worried uh, they're going to use those tactics uh, in order to get the information that they need so that they can steal resources from you. So how does stress, which is a common component of many mental health issues, affect an individual's ability to detect the social engineering attempts? Yeah, so when we're stressed, our amygdala sends fear responses to our adrenal glands. Those adrenal glands release cortisol into the brain and cortisol is the stress hormone. And uh, that causes our prefrontal cortex and the blood flow in our prefrontal cortex to actually shut down, uh, which operates out of our limbic system. And that is not the area of reason and logic. You want your prefrontal cortex working because that's how we rationalize. That's how we think through problems. Um, <clears throat> so if they can get that shut off, then they have 
uh, a pretty good access to manipulate and to get you to do things that you might not otherwise agree to. So with this uh, shutdown of the frontal cortex, is this like a voluntary thing or an involuntary reaction? It's absolutely involuntary. Um, we we don't have any kind of notification that our prefrontal cortex isn't working properly. Uh, the, the signs and symptoms of that would be like shortened breath, if you notice tension in your shoulders, um, if you are having trouble formulating thoughts or thinking through processes, those are the types of behaviors that will signal to you that you are at high risk for an attack or for mm -hmm. uh, being manipulated. So would you say um, using uh, certain situations where people would be more prone to things like uh, they have a high stress job or they have like some personal issues that these attackers could pull on to try to manipulate them. Right. A lot of the attacks, they use um, word sets and language that would uh, register some high emotions. So for example, you get a email from your mom and she needs $1,500 right away. Um, you know, something that would have you, someone you really care about would really raise those emotional centers and cause your stress hormones to start taking off. Mm -hmm. um, so they use um, parents, family members, kids, uh, anything like that. Or maybe they'll pretend to be your IT department. And so if you're new at a job and you don't want to make waves, you don't want to cause problems, uh, they're counting on you to not violate that social norm and, and kind of push back. They're counting on you to be caught off and, and kind of going with their flow rather than mm -hmm. them adhering to yours. Especially if you're new, you probably don't know the policies yet, so they probably would prey upon those types of things also. Yeah, if you look at the percentage rates of people that are fallen subject to phishing and vishing scams, uh, the percentage rates are predominantly higher for newer employees. And you see the data kind of taper downward the longer an employee has been with the company, which makes sense because they're counting on you not knowing the processes that may happen. So, and I, they might say they're an IT person that's trying to uh, install a patch to fix a problem. And if you haven't been in that department long and you're not familiar with your IT department, and you're new, you would be a lot more likely to go along with something like that. And also with the rise of AI and voice generation, you would also see many attacks where someone would pretend to call you saying that I'm your mother or son or whatever, I'm in jail, I need this. Would that also highly influence people to do something like that? Absolutely, because any any normal person, if they imagine a loved one that's in a really sticky situation, um, they're going to want to act quickly to remove the suffering from that person in their life. So um, there have been a lot of reports of getting like three second clips of people's voices and then creating a phone call from that that makes you think it's actually that relative. Um, it'd be really good to get a safe word with the people that are in your life so that there's kind of a password uh, situation uh, so that that doesn't happen, especially with AI's abilities to mimic and um, and trick in that way. Would you say be more apt to be susceptible to these if you hear like the voice versus just seeing text or hearing a stranger's voice? Well, you know, it really depends on the situation that you're in. Um, <clears throat> For example, um, I know someone that was a business owner and they are constantly ordering from Amazon. And so for them, uh, the email was what almost got them because they're constantly sending emails and, and mm -hmm. hackers and um, con artists, they will try to figure out what your motive of uh, communication is. So they, they will try to reach you in the ways that you're used to engaging. Uh, and so that can make it really difficult to identify who's really in your bubble and trying to help you versus who is trying to pretend to be someone that they're not. Kind of like when some like a scammer tries calling you on a phone, probably try to get that three second clip and probably mm -hmm. use that to then get one of your other family members to say, hey, I'm in trouble. Right. And, and get it, that frontal cortex kind of shut down so that you can get that person to 
do something that they want to logically do. Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> for example, there was a case recently. Um, it's a little dark, but it's it's a serious issue. There was a case recently where some scammers um, had called pretending to be kidnappers, and and this man was an elderly man. He wasn't aware of some of the types of attacks that happen. <clears throat> and he ended up, um, they ordered an Uber to his house and then told him that that Uber driver was a part of their, quote, network. Mm -hmm. And uh, he ended up acting against the innocent and unknowing Uber driver and landed him in some pretty serious trouble. Mm -hmm. So they can very easily take a situation and make it very serious very quickly. Uh, yeah just by these kind of tech trade tricks that, mm -hmm. that we pick up, which are constantly evolving and updating because technology is rapidly evolving Changing. and updating. Yeah. Makes sense. So how would you say that social engineering exploits and vulnerabilities would relate to self-esteem? Yeah, so people with lower self-esteem um, or with issues with self-esteem they tend to try to adhere to social norms uh, as much as they can because they don't want to be shamed or guilted. Mm -hmm. And um, that's an emotion that a lot of scammers really prey on to. Uh, they're counting on you to um, to not push back. So if you if you say, oh, my company tells me not to share my password with anybody, they might say, oh, but I've got 75 more calls and we just need to get this done really quick, right? That kind of thing to kind of push you against questioning or pushing back and people that don't have a good sense of self that don't have a good self-esteem they would be more likely to not want to cause that emotional tension because emotional tension is uncomfortable for all of us mm -hmm. and um, some people know that and try to exploit it so when a vic when a person does become a victim of social engineering do you think it's common for them to feel shame and like not want to talk about those things or absolutely almost every person that i've talked to uh, has a great deal of shame and embarrassment around this and and the important thing to remember is it can literally happen to anyone it, it's not a measure of your intelligence um, or anything of that nature these people their job is to figure out where the weak link is and that doesn't say anything about you as a person, but the best thing to do is just to be educated so that you can be aware of the different tactics and act accordingly in confidence and not be worried about making that wrong move. I would also like probably add, like if you don't report it, then maybe the weak link can not be strengthened, would you say? Like so Right. Take this not as like, oh, I'm such a horrible person to turn it more into like, this is a learning experience. Like, okay, this is what I need to look out for and talk to your company or talk to your family member saying, okay, this is what you look out for. This is how you can avoid these types of situations. Right. Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> the, um, the hardest part, right, is is admitting that, that something has gone the way you didn't intend for it to go. But um, by not sharing that information, you put yourself at risk for um, more scams. They might get a little bit of information that you feel might not be super important. But for example, if they just get the address book of the company that you work for, then they could pose as any number of those people in that address book. And in some cases, uh, scammers have gotten the actual usernames of people's logins just by accessing that contact book. So uh, even if you've messed up, you know, the first thing to realize is everyone can get fooled. Uh, this is a very complex system that they use to manipulate and uh, being honest is the best way to ready yourself and to protect yourself against future attacks and to be aware of um, what you're vulnerable to. So with all these, do you have any like strategies to help you become less vulnerable to these attacks? Yeah, absolutely. Um, the first thing to always remember is if you catch yourself having an emotional reaction, if you catch yourself feeling stressed, if you catch yourself feeling that something is not right, 
oftentimes we'll have a gut feeling. Just don't be afraid to push back and ask questions, mm -hmm. even if uh, the IT person on the other line does have 75 calls to make and they do have a lot of work to do. You know, that's their position and that's what they're supposed to be doing. So just allow yourself to sit in that discomfort with the pushback and um, not be afraid to say no in those situations. And also anytime that you see um, a situation where they want you to rush or just do this real quick, or the quicker they try to push you to go, that is a bigger signal to slow way down. And the second look at everything, and take a deep breath. The best thing that we can do to get our prefrontal cortexes working again is a nice deep breath for like 30 seconds or so, and that'll allow the blood flow needed. And then you'll begin to be able to make those decisions a lot easier. So with going on with that, like breathing techniques, um, are there any other techniques that can help someone kind of get used to that discomfort so that they don't feel as bad to do that pushback? Um, yeah, there are some things uh, that you can do to build some self-confidence and some, um, some self-esteem. <clears throat> Always make sure that you're getting enough uh, sleep. Uh, that sleep is so important for our emotional well-being. Uh, you wouldn't think it would be, and, and some people really like to push and, and go, but it's, it's really important to do those basic self-care things take care of yourself um and that seems i know that seems so like broad <laughs> yeah. but <clears throat> but just showing yourself compassion and showing yourself some care can really go a long way um also just just try to take things slower we're in such a fast-paced world especially in the world of technology we're constantly pushed to get things done quicker and faster um and just try to slow down and slow your breathing. What you want to activate is your peripheral network. Uh, and that can be activated by taking a walk, by the deep breaths, uh, imagining yourself in a relaxing place. Um, just uh, try to put yourself at ease and that will allow everything else to flow. So would you say that there's kind of like the stigma around talking about mental health, about all the negative things? Like what would you say mental health would be so that people don't think of it as like a dirty word so that right. they're not susceptible to these types of attacks? Because I know it's kind of like an odd topic to like link mental health with cybersecurity. Right. Well, really what we're talking about in both of those is um, – preventative measures for well-being, right? You want to learn how to be safe in the world, how to interact with the world, and you want to learn how to keep your data safe, your information safe. And so even though they seem completely, not completely unrelated, but they do have a lot of overlap in uh, the types of processes that you would go through to have a healthier life. Um, so uh, I would recommend um, I would recommend just trying to find things that build your happiness build your joy and um, in America we have a bigger stigma about mental illness uh, we operate off the DSM-5 and other countries don't operate off of a symptom-based list so in America when you go in to be diagnosed with a mental illness, they look at all the negatives. And there are actually a lot of positives also to all different brain types. We are all very different down to our core and there are benefits in, in all of the ways that we exist. So. Because like you said earlier, everyone can be susceptible to social engineering, even if you have like the top mental health or even the poor mental health. It's just a matter of recognizing the triggers so that you can uh, pump on the brakes or try to redirect things. Right. Yeah. Everyone, even, even mental health professionals uh, get scanned and, and conned, you know, it's, we as a, as a human species are uh, a trusting species overall that like to connect with people and social engineering just kind of manipulates that connection 
in order to gain access to information. So as long as you're not thinking about what information you might be giving out, you're definitely susceptible to being hacked or being um, losing some of your important information. Kind of like I have this bit of information, give me money or it's going to be exposed and ruin your life type of things. Right. Yeah. But also like even information that you wouldn't think of, for example, there was a man that uh, did landscaping and he put on his website all of the businesses that he did landscaping for. Mm -hmm. And um, there was a hacker that got on his website, saw these company, which to him, he is broadcasting. I've done this. You know, these are the good, reputable businesses that I work for. I do all of their work. And they contacted those businesses claiming to be part of his company mm -hmm. and changed the bank number. And he didn't find out until three months later. Mm -hmm. And and so for him, in his mind, he was thinking, oh, I'm going to advertise this because people will like Good. those brands and yeah. then they'll want to get my work because it's professional. But just in that posting that information that he thought was probably a non-issue, it created a big issue both for him and his clients. So sometimes we are not aware because we don't think that way mm -hmm. um, what we're giving out to the world. But just being careful of that and being knowledgeable about that, whether it's, you know, um, hackers might call and say that they received a notice about your company's upcoming launch and wanted to ask some questions. Right. Mm -hmm. And then just knowing that they know that information, you assume that they might be more involved than they are. So just being aware of those little bits of information that you're letting out. And also be mindful that there's been so many data breaches out there already that a lot of your information is already out there. So even if you don't give out the information, you still should think that, okay, these types of information like my address and email addresses and all these other things are already out there and I can't control that. So for those types of information, how would you say would be the best way to combat that through? Uh, that's a that's a great question. So mindfulness, it's it's interesting that you mentioned that word because that is actually an excellent strategy to combating a lot of this because what they are counting on is for you to not be aware, for you to be thinking about what you're going to eat for dinner, for you to be thinking about what's happening next week or uh, something else that's going on. They don't want you to be in the present moment because they don't want you paying attention. Mm -hmm. So the more techniques and tricks that you can use to keep yourself more aware, keep yourself in the present moment, that's going to have you optimized for standing against whatever someone may be throwing at you. So with these in mind, would you say that people should be like paranoid to anyone they interact with? Or do you think that they should have like a healthy dose of criticism? Um, yeah, I always, the, the phrase that I use is trust then verify. Mm -hmm. uh, so if they call from IT, you know, ask what their name is. Um, and then look that name up in your company registry. See if it comes up, you know. And uh, if, if you can, ask if you can call them back and see if the number that they give you is the same as what shows up on your caller ID, because a lot of times these scammers will spoof the number mm -hmm. so that you don't know where they came from. Mm -hmm. uh, so just little little steps like that can really help uh, safeguard against some pretty pretty common attacks. Also, like you said, family members have like a safe word so that if you are talking on the phone, if they don't say the safe word, then you know, okay, this is fake. And That's right. That's a up. good way to verify. And it's a good way to um, to build rapport with your family and really feel like you're a united front against these mm -hmm. kind of data attacks. So you're not feeling like you're being you against them. It's like we all come together to uh, prevent ourselves from being a victim. Right. And then if you get a phone call from dad and he says, I'm in jail, and you say, what's the password? And mm -hmm. he doesn't have an answer. Well, then... You don't have to sit there and worry and wonder and and like, go through that whole emotional really roller coaster. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You don't have to deal with the emotional roller coaster of that unsurety that they're betting on you to have. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it seems like we have a lot of great tips and discussion. Is there anything else you want to add on before we uh, finish up this? 
top of our discussion? No, I think this is a really important conversation to have um, because it does touch everyone's life. There is mm -hmm. no um, shielding your information from the dark web. You know, there is no uh, way to completely disband these types of criminals. This is a, a new frontier. And the only thing that we can do to protect ourselves with it is to really be educated and to know what they're watching for so that we can respond appropriately. And very important to keep your mental health up. up. <laughs> Absolutely. So. The, the brain thinks that taking care of yourself and sitting in your feelings and all of that hippy dippy stuff is unnecessary. But what you have mm -hmm. to understand is the brain was geared towards survival. And so the only thing that it is worried about is, is it going to kill me? Will I survive this? And so, of course, you know, feeling your feelings and taking care of yourself and drinking water and getting sleep, uh, your brain is going to interpret all of that as completely unnecessary. And it really is so necessary to having a good footing on reality and a good footing on the decisions that you want to make. And probably a good way to think of attackers as this will kill me, so I need to keep myself <laughs> up guard against them <laughs> absolutely yeah <laughs> so do you have any like social media presence or any things that you want to promote before we end our discussion because i know that in the past you had some uh, webinars that you were i up. do so i'm working right now um in a nonprofit organization called mindfulness outreach of kentucky moki for short um, so you could just uh, Google Moki and uh, you'll find some some resources and I'm hoping to to have some more content and resources to come up soon. Yep. And if you want to give me any links, I can put them in the description for anyone to reach out to them if they want to. That sounds and great. Yeah. Also, don't be too afraid to find a counselor <laughs> to talk things out if you need to. Um, I know that a lot of people do feel the shame after they get a, get into attacks. Just remember that everyone is susceptible to these attacks. You becoming a victim is not anything that you should be ashamed of. You should be more ashamed of not talking out and not telling your stories and, or at least letting your employer know, hey, this is how I got tricked. Can we work on a solution to fix it? And most employers aren't going to be like, oh, you did this, you're fired. They're more likely to work with you to say, okay, let's make sure that this doesn't happen in the future. Let's plug up the holes here. And if you become more mindful, you'd say that less likely to become a victim, not down to zero, but probably less from 90% to like maybe looking at like 50% or even lower than that. Right. At the end of the day, we're all human. And we're all learning as we go. Um, so reaching out and, and sharing that information and learning together is, is definitely a better option than the alternative. All right. So with that said, we're going to uh, end this podcast or this episode. Uh, thank you for being on. Yeah. And being a thing. Um, you can listen to us at any Anywhere that the podcast is uh, spread out, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and some other things. Um, so we're going to close this out, and hopefully we'll hear you in the next episode. And goodbye. Thanks for listening to the Simple Cyber Defense Security Updates. Join us next time when we dive into more security issues, and make sure you subscribe to the podcast so you never miss an episode. Plus, if you have a topic suggestion or want to support the podcast, stop by our website at simplecyberdefense.com.